This is Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, brought to you by the Iowa Soybean Association. Your daily recap of the information that affects Iowa's farmers, producers, and consumers, right here in the heart of the heartland. With reports from our award-winning broadcast team of Dustin Hoffman, Riley Smith, and Mark Magnuson. Now, from the IARN studios in Des Moines, here's Dustin Hoffman. Good day, everyone, and welcome to Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Dustin Huffman. Today is Friday, May the 5th, 2023. Hope you have a great day going for you so far. Coming up a little later in the show, we're going to talk about the rural economy against the macro economy with Farm Credit Services' Matt Erickson. We'll also take a look at that ag weather outlook, but first, let's run down the markets. It's time now for the Ag Matters PM Closing Market Summary, your source for market analysis and settlement prices from the day's trade in Chicago, courtesy of the folks at agmarket.net. We're talking right now with Tyler Shaw of agmarket.net, and Tyler, we uh, got through the trading week. What did we see on those grains? Uh, we actually ended up posting kind of some nice reversals uh, the week. Uh, it started out kind of a bloodbath again Monday and Tuesday, especially in the wheat market. And, you know, what, what likely happened, we've been talking about the, the large managed money short in the wheat market over the last several weeks. Uh, we may have just ran out of willing sellers. At some point, you know, the market finds that there's no one else that really wants to sell. Uh, and so the, 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 the folks that were already short, uh, they buy their positions back and there's kind of a flush to the buy side. And and all of a sudden, you see what we've seen. You take July Kansas City wheat, for example, uh, triggered a low in the overnight uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning in that 736 range and actually got as high as 839. It's going to settle somewhere in that 835 range, almost a dollar move over the last three trading days in July Kansas City wheat. Uh, you know, we've been saying on the corn market, we were going to have to have wheat do something in order to see any bright spots in corn. And that's translated over to the corn market. Uh, we've got corn about 30 cents off of its lows from the Wednesday night trade as well. So seeing a positive in the grain markets, a uh, little bit of drought concerns start to come in across the corn belt. That's also uh, pushing prices a little bit higher right now. But I try to remind people that I talk to it is the, the first week in May. So if you're going to have a drought at some point, probably better to have it in May than in July. So I wouldn't get too bold up on that news quite yet. Yeah, and I get where you're coming from on that. But, you know, talking to some of the Iowa and Nebraska farmers, though, too, they've been having a drought since uh, last year or even sometimes it feels like the year before. But, you know, exactly like you said, getting the seed in the ground, the drought isn't as important as when we actually get that seed germinating. Now, what else is out there moving the markets? I know there's been concern about whether Russia will allow the grain corridor to keep going. I mean, what are we seeing on that front? Yeah, that was the, the story Wednesday of the drone attack or supposed drone attack on the Kremlin and an attempt on Putin's life. Um, there's also some chatter that the, the grain discussion, there were was, was some meetings yesterday or today, I don't remember which day, but uh, on the grain export corridor. I've heard chatter that uh, there's been no resolution out of that. It's not all that surprising. Every time we've come to one of these uh, negotiation extensions, we basically hear negotiations aren't going well, market pumps up some premium, and then we find out, oh, we're gonna extend it another 30 days if certain conditions are met. Uh, I don't know where I sit on that. I, I have been telling some of my customers, I really don't wanna be short wheat through a weekend. If you remember back uh, over the last year, we've really seen some big moves in the wheat market on Sunday night opens. Uh, so we've been trying to kind of stay out of those positions at the close on Friday. So it'll be interesting to see how this next week plays out. All right, switching over to livestock, cattle, hogs, what did we see coming out of today? Uh, you know, we usually answer hogs last. We'll start there today. Another brutal day in the hog market. You've got, uh, you know, the, the hog market futures are settled against the, the, a cash index, right? And so if you look at May futures, they settle next Friday, I think, uh, the 12th. Uh, so that that May futures has got to come in about where the cash market is. You can see May futures are down at seventy five dollars and fifty two cents. June hogs uh, were upwards of ninety one dollars earlier uh, in the week. Uh, settled down today at eighty three seventy seven. 
a lot of uh, technical analysts were saying, you know, if we if we broke down through about 8750, that would be a bearish signal. We did that on Wednesday, and so as you can see, it's just uh, down uh, about five dollars since then. Uh, so kind of tough in the hogs. We we need to see the cash market do something. We did see a good export report on hogs. So maybe we'll start to see that cash market inch higher. That would be helpful for the hog futures. Uh, but it's just been a, a tough go. Cattle market, you know, I, I work out in Western North Dakota. I have a lot of ranchers that I deal with. Uh, I also sell the, the LRP, Livestock Revenue Protection. So in touch with a lot of them on getting some, some calves and some yearlings protected. I had a lot of phone calls uh, really the last two days. We've seen the, the August and September board drop in that 8 to $10 range over the last uh, week. That's got people a little bit nervous. Uh, I don't think that the, the rally is over in feeder cattle. We've still got tight supplies. Uh, pullbacks like this are healthy for a market. Kind of give us a little breathing room uh, and, and maybe get ready for a, a, maybe a little more organized rally over the summer. All right. Well, Tyler, a lot of great insight as always. If folks want to pick the brains of everybody at agmarket.net, what's the best way for them to do that? Look us up on the World Wide Web, agmarket.net. If you want to call me directly, the number is 701-987-6009. All right, Tyler, thanks so much for the insight. We'll talk to you again next week. You bet. Take care. That again was Tyler Shaw of agmarket.net. Let's go ahead and run down the closing numbers. That comes to us courtesy of the folks at Bar Chart. July corn was up seven and a half at five ninety six and a half. December new crop up six and a quarter at five thirty four and three quarters. July beans up eighteen and three quarters at fourteen thirty six and a half. November up eleven and a half at twelve eighty even. Soybean meal up a dollar fifty at four twenty six ten per ton. Soy oil up a buck eighty five at fifty four thirty three. Chicago wheat up fifteen and a quarter at six sixty and a quarter. Minneapolis up twenty four cents at eight thirty six even. Kansas wheat up thirty four and three quarters at eight thirty three. Oats for July, a dime higher at 329. June live cattle, 35 cents higher at the close, 161.92. May feeders, a buck 12 lower at 202.52. Lean hogs, a dollar 55 lower at 75.52. Pork cutouts, a buck 80 lower at 80.80. And class three milk for May, 11 cents lower at 1657. And that's been our Ag Market Recap. We're going to take a short break and hear from our sponsor, the Iowa Soybean Association and the Soy Checkoff. And when we come back, I talk with Matt Erickson of Farm Credit Services of America. This is Ag Matters PM. Iowa Soybean Association is driven to deliver for Iowa's 40,000 soybean farmers. We're proud to provide objective agronomic research, a helping hand with soil and water stewardship, and timely industry news powered by the Soybean Checkoff. Learn more at IASoybeans.com. Welcome back to AMPM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Dustin Huffman. Well, we know the macro economy has put the whole global economy basically into an interesting situation. We know interest rates are higher. They just raised them another quarter percent this week. But when you got to get operating loans and look against what we're getting for our grains and other commodities at the marketplace, we got to start wondering how is this affecting both farmers and rural communities as a whole. For that, we talk with Matt Erickson of Farm Credit Services of America to get some insight from him. All right, we're talking right now with Matt Erickson of Farm Credit here at Washington Watch 2023 in D.C. And thanks so much for taking a few minutes to talk with us today, Eric. Yeah, good to be with you. So, Matt, we're talking a lot about economy, whether that's the macro economy, the global economy. Of course, we also got to talk about the farm economy yeah. and what's going on there. And I mean, rural America tends to get hit plenty hard, even though prices are good right now, I mean, what challenges are we seeing at this particular time? Yeah, you know, I think when we look at the past two years, you know, we had we had really good levels of farm income and producers were able to build up some of that working capital for their operations and kind of plan using um, that, that additional working capital. Now, as we know, that production costs, they tend to lag with high prices. And so now for 2023, we're seeing margins a little bit tighter. You know, prices are still good, uh, but, you know, things like you know, fertilizer, you know, prices, while they are coming down, they are expensive. And so all those different things, it's important that farmers and our, our customers, that we're resilient with our margins and knowing what our margins are and what our numbers are. And so that's what we continue to stress uh, to, to our customers. On the flip side, we've got the macro economy. You know, things like inflation, things like the labor market, things like interest rates, all those things have an impact on um, at, the, at the farm gate. And so, you know, I think right now when we talk about the interest rate environment, it's got to be linked with inflation. 
because that's the driving force of these interest rate increases. And so right now we're between 4.75 and 5%. Um, you know, when we talk about interest rates and interest rate edu education, farmers have different levels of interest rates. Prime's about a 300, 305 basis point spread uh, over, over the past 30 years with the federal funds rate. And so kind of knowing that, that kind of puts puts us in a direction where we can have some, some education with our customers. Now obviously we, we know that crop prices are high as of right now. Sometimes we've had to make these decisions and crop prices have not been that high. How is that helping make that adjustment for farmers in this time? Like you said, they're able to put some capital down or able to save some capital, make some adjustments, but even so, I mean, how is this helping? What's, what's, what's it doing overall? Yeah, you know, I think overall, when I, when I talk with our customers, I think the big fear is we've lived through those days of 2012 and 2013, especially on the row crop side. And, you know, we have seen, you know, prices at really high levels over the past couple of years. Things can turn relatively quickly. And, you know, everything over the, probably last year and the year prior to that was supply driven. Now the expectation is Brazil's going to have a, a rel actually a historically high, you know, corn crop and soybean crop. Um, the U.S. is expected to have, you know, 92 million acres of corn, 181 bushels uh, an acre for, for corn. So we could switch to over to a supply side situation. So what I tell producers and our customers is, you know, what time, what, what period of time within 2023 should we be looking at? And that time period to me, when I talk to the row crop guys, it's between June and August where we've got the, the second corn crop from Brazil hitting the market. We've got the U.S. weather situation. Those things collide during that time period. And so right now, I think, you know, when we look at markets, a lot of attention is going to be on the U.S. weather situation here uh, moving forward for the 2023 crop. And there's so much at play, I mean, to affect the farm. Like you mentioned Brazil, how much that can affect the farm in Iowa or Illinois that, you know, you wouldn't think would have that effect. But like you said, also the inflation to drives the consumer demand, you know, even though we may, because eventually, I mean, we've had some years where the West has had some drought. I mean, Iowa can't buy a bucket of rain once in a while. Right. But the thing is, eventually that's going to change again. It does cycle. Right. And eventually we're, we may see, we could see a year like Brazil is having. I was down in Brazil three months ago, believe me, the rumors are true. Yeah. It's a good looking crop. Yep. And, and so, I mean, eventually that can happen. If we make that big supply switch in a time when demand could be weakening or even further weakened, I mean, how much of a mess could that be, especially when you balance that against weather, when you balance that against demand for exports, you about could be a rail strike. I mean, there's so right. much at play. How does a farmer protect themselves? So when, when I talk with our customers, there's a lot going on, whether it's a black swan event with Russia, Ukraine, if it's, you know, consecutive years of drought down in South America, the beauty with markets is the supply and demand fundamentals work, and they're continue, continuing to work. And so, you know, when we have these high price situations, supply side economics tend to fix themselves with overproduction. We could be seeing that. However, it's still a long way away. You know, right now, I think markets are focused in on planting, what the weather's going to be like for the planting season. But once that crop gets in the ground, it's going to be, you know, how much rain is going to be, you know, forecasted. Um, you know, are we going to have, like, like last year, we had a flash drought, you know, across the Midwest at the end of June. All of those things, one, it's hard to predict, but two, it doesn't go against the supply and demand fundamentals. And so, you know, a lot can, actually over the past two years, a lot has been thrown at producers. But if we keep our focus on the supply and demand fundamentals and say, you know, if this weather market happens, this is what it does to supply and demand, we can, we can really work together and, and really help farmers navigate this, this uncertainty that's out there. It's having that conversation is the most important part. It is. It doesn't matter how big or small or what your operation is, it's getting that initial conversation. That's right. And you know, when, when I work with producers, this year's a big, a big issue on margins. And so we've got production costs higher, we've got prices still relatively healthy, how long will that stay? It depends on the crop. But, you know, we haven't talked about livestock. You know, the swine guys, the swine producers out there, margins are really hurting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to pay six, six fifty corn, you know, to, to feed that to feed that hog, that really makes it difficult for those swine producers. And so you also look at soybean meal. We're seeing exceptional drought in Argentina. Argentina is a big exporter in the global market in terms of soybean meal. All that has an interplay when it terms, uh, in terms of the, the swine margin that producers have to think about. So again, row crop has, has its own bucket, livestock has its own bucket as well. And so again, we have customers on both sides of the aisle there and we have to work through that. You know, and that's been the interesting kind of the thing we've taken away is I've never met a, a, a farmer that produces just one commodity, right. no matter what it is. And so that bucket is different, like you said, for livestock that's compared right. to greens. 
and you kind of got to get that bu those two buckets to, to jump into the one whole bucket. That's right. Well, and even on the cattle side, you know, you look at cattle. I mean, right now we're going through that cycle of liquidation. Uh, you know, we're seeing the impacts from drought, especially from last year. Um, you know, hay supplies, hay production from last year, we're at the lowest level since the 50s with hay production. And so, you know, for it, one, it's important to have a, a good corn crop, you know, this year in terms of feeding livestock and, and, and getting those, those things in balance. But again, we're a long way away. But, you know, what's encouraging to me is the supply and demand fundamentals still work, and they will continue to work throughout this process. So, if, you know, for a farmer, this can be stressful. It can be downright frightening. Very much. Uh, you, you're, th you're thinking, especially if you're looking at a multiple generation farm. Right. You have a lot of. You feel like you have a lot of pressure on you. So, what's the advice that you can give to the farmers to make them understand that they're not at this alone? Be resilient. That's first and foremost. Two, you know, be follow the markets. You know, especially, you know, last year was the, a year of volatility. This year, you know, I think it's volatility, but it's also uncertainty. You know, with we can't predict the weather. The weather is an uncertain variable, but we can follow the supply and demand funnel, fundamentals that, that say, okay, if we're expected to have a good corn crop, you know, what does that mean for markets? It probably means it's bearish. And so all those different things, they're important. At the same token is when we develop budgets and help our customers work through that process, it's all about understanding your production costs. It's all about understanding your margin. If you haven't locked in some of those variable um, expenses, it's okay to erase it and sensitize it. And a pencil always has an eraser. And so making sure that farmers are really comfortable with their margin is especially important here in 2023. All right, so folks want to learn more about what they need to know going into this year or maybe having to adjust on the fly during this year. Where's the best way for them to get started on that? Yeah, they can go to farmcredit.com. Um, and then th that'll navigate through which district that they're that they're located in, and we're always helped to, to be experts with within agriculture and help our producers side by side. All right, well, Matt, we thank you so much for the insight here today. Thank you very much. That again was Matt Erickson of Farm Credit Services. Let's go ahead and take a look at that ag weather outlook. Well, definitely a cloudy, dreary day after a beautiful, warm summer-like day almost yesterday. Starting to feel like spring actually figured out where it was supposed to be. A little bit of rain shower activity in the forecast, which I know does impede planting progress some, but again, a welcome shower of rain. We'll take what we can get. Let's go ahead and see what the National Weather Service has in store for Iowa over the next 24 hours. Well, definitely going to be a cloudy and somewhat rainy forecast here across much of the state, and I think that's going to be welcome news. Today, chance of showers and storms across most of the state. We will see some sunshine to the east. Highs will be in the upper 60s to the mid-70s. Now, tonight, we could see showers and storms statewide. Lows will be in the mid to upper 50s. Tomorrow, chance of showers and storms will diminish throughout the day, but it's still going to be there. Highs in the mid-70s to the mid-80s. Looking at the affiliate weather map coming up for you tomorrow, Cherokee chance of showers in 74, Shenandoah cloudy with a chance of thunderstorms in 85, Des Moines cloudy and some rain in 79, Waterloo cloudy in 73 with occasional showers, Albia looking for occasional showers and storms at a high 81, Clinton seeing showers and a high of 76 degrees. For more detailed forecasts in your area, tune to your local Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network affiliate. And that's been our Ag Weather Outlook. And with that, we're at the end of today's show. You can find all our content online at iowaagnet.com. While you're there, don't forget to sign up for our e-newsletter. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and on our YouTube channel. Don't forget while you're there to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you're notified every time we put out a new video project. You can also check out our free Twice Daily Market podcast on Amazon, Apple, Google, Spotify, and Podbean. From the IARN studios in Des Moines, I'm Dustin Huffman. For Riley Smith and Mark Magnuson, we thank you for watching. This has been Ag Matters PM.